Kevin, thank you very much for talking to us today about what might constitute an educated 19-year-old. My first question for you really is just to ask you to clarify why you think it's particularly important to talk about 19-year-olds. Why have you chosen to talk about them? Well, in one sense, it isn't that important that it is 19. It's an entirely arbitrary age. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mark any kind of point of maturation or a biological change at 19. But it does reflect what have become the norms of our society as to what is expected in terms of young people's education and how long they should stay in education and training. Mm -hmm. So in the past uh, it was normal for young people to leave school at 15 and then 16. And now it is normal for young people to leave education and training um, when they're 18 or 19. And I've chosen 19 because uh, young people with summer birthdays would have finished by then. So they should have finished their compulsory education. And also, more recently, it reflects uh, legislative change that uh, young people this year must stay in education until the end of the academic year where they become 17, mm -hmm. and next year when they're 18. Mm -hmm. So by law, young people will have to be in education, um, employed with training, or some form of training, mm -hmm. until they are at least 18. Therefore, I've chosen 19. Mm -hmm. um, but as I say, I, I think it does reflect what has become normal within society, so that mm -hmm. society as a whole has considered uh, that young people should be in education and training until that time. Mm -hmm. So the change in legislation that there has been, um, significant in one sense, will not lead to great change, because the proportion of young people aged 18 who are not in education and training is very, very small. And it will be interesting to see really whether that legislation makes any difference at all. Yeah. The other reason I wanted to choose 19 was because I was very interested by and uh, very informed by the work of Richard Pring and the Nuffield Review of 14 to 19 Education. And they built their tremendous research project, it's all available online, they built their research project around the question what counts as an educated 19 year old in this day and age? And it seems to me that that kind of question just is not asked often enough. That the policy debate within the UK has focused, especially within England, has focused very much on qualifications. What qualifications should young people have? How should they be tested? Has there been grade inflation, GCSEs? Or uh, what new vocational qualifications should we have that might compare with their levels? Rather than asking, what should they know? Mm -hmm. What should young people be able to do? We can think about the qualifications afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I think that that perhaps has led to the kind of problems that we have seen very recently with the OECD report, the OECD kind of think tank for um, the leading industrial nations, who have found that in England and Northern Ireland that uh, our young people aged between 16 and 24, have got some of the poorest mm. numeracy and literacy skills mm. uh, anywhere in the uh, uh, industrialised world, which is, which is shocking. Mm. So clearly, as a society, uh, we are asking the wrong questions. Mm. And I think as starting with, what is an educated 19-year-old? Mm. Can we reach a consensus or even have a discussion about that? Mm. I think that's a much better place to start than how should we test them. Okay. So it's something of a natural watershed just because of the way we structure our education system. But it also strikes me as a slightly more positive way to look at the whole issue because we often talk about it as a deficit and wondering, yeah, you know, right. what is it that they can't do. So so just twisting that question to be, you know, what is what do we expect? What is a literate nineteen year old seems to be a positive way to frame the question. Yeah. That's how I'd like to see it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that sort of leads on nicely to the next question, which is around who you think does decide what an educated 19-year-old ought to be. Yeah, well as I say, I think it does, many of these things reflect the norms of, of society, but look, UK society is very unequal, and um, therefore the, the kind of people who are making decisions that affect all of us are those who have been successful within an unequal society. Mm -hmm. And those people, I'm not suggesting they're wicked or bad people, but they're people who've had academic success of a particular kind. Mm -hmm. They're people who, therefore, have been educated in a certain way, and educated very well. well they are well-educated, were well-educated 19-year-olds. Mm -hmm. But their view of what an educated 19-year-old is narrow. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the, the House of Commons at the moment, there are 
the, as a proportion, there's a greater proportion of members of parliament who went to one school than have come from a vocational background. Now that one school is Eton. Mm -hmm. So we have more MPs who went to one school than have had experience of being uh, a plumber or uh, working in construction or and this is this is a real change. You know, in the past, especially on the labour benches, that would have been normal to have had former miners or former engineers. This mm -hmm. is not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. So on both sides of the House of Commons, we have people who have been to Oxford and Cambridge, mm -hmm. very often though not exclusively uh, privately educated, mm -hmm. who are making decisions based upon their own education. Mm -hmm. And there are some who say, I wouldn't argue this, but there are some who say that uh, every um, education minister decides what an educated 19 year old is based upon how they were when they were 19. People like me. People like me. People like me. So I, I think that the kind of people making the decisions now are people who don't have experience of vocational education, mm -hmm. who were successful in a particular kind, want to open up that particular kind of education, academic education, mm -hmm. and therefore we have the system that we have. Mm -hmm. Now this links in really to that, that difference, I guess, that difference in perception around types of education. And, and why do you think it is that vocational education is considered, yeah. generally considered to be inferior to academic education in Britain? Does it link to these same issues? I think it does. I mean, I think first of all it's important to, to recognise that, that vocational education is considered to be second rate in, um, in Britain. Now, let's, let's be cautious. One of the things that the Nuffield Review said was that there is a kind of ambivalence towards the word vocational. Because when you're talking about the training of lawyers or doctors, clearly this is vocational, even if it's not called that. And clearly those are very high status. Architects might be the same, accountants, accountancy training. These are all high status. So when in this country people talk of vocational education, they tend to mean uh, relatively low skilled mm -hmm. uh, training. Um, associated with uh, with poorer pay as well, uh, to, um, you know, that's that's those things very often go together. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that we do live in such an unequal society and becoming more unequal, that there are lots of, if you like, proxies for that inequality. Even the way you might hold your knife, your knife and fork, these things are markers of class. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important markers of class is your education. And therefore it is perhaps understandable that people who are aspirational, people who want the best for their own children, will want them to follow an academic route because that is the, that is the route which has the highest status um, within, uh, within, British, within British society. And that's been a problem going back really a century and a half. You, you can find people writing about this as an issue that vocational education does not have the status it needs going right back to the reign of Victoria. Mm. And I guess it, it was exacerbated um, after the Second World War and the Education Act that came into, um, that came into being at, at that time, which kind of divided young people up between those who went to vocational, those who went to academic, and all the rest. Mm. And although we don't have that system in place, Quite the same way today. Nonetheless, that kind of tripartite mm -hmm. thinking, I think, remains. There's a legacy. There is. That. And part of that legacy, I think, is that vocational education has become associated with kind of remedial education mm -hmm. or um, education that deals with disaffection. Now, I mean, I think that's a very important thing to do. I think dealing with young people's disaffection is mm -hmm. crucial, absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. But if that becomes synonymous mm -hmm. with vocational education, then that does denigrate mm. vocational education. Mm. And I'm thinking particularly about the Training and Vocational Education Initiative, mm. 1983, mm. TVEI, which had a lot of money put into it, but that was much less about good vocational education and much more about dealing with disaffected young people. Mm. And I think that's a problem. Yes. It seems to me you painted a picture here of detailed picture of, of how education relates to those wider societal yeah. issues and that an education isn't only about the, the knowledge that you acquire or the skills that you gain but it's also kind of linked in with the whole sort of issue of manners and the way one yeah. speaks and the words one uses and how one dresses and that 
and that vocational education has been, is, is that kind of what you're saying, that they've been tied to um, ways of behaving, ways of speaking that have a lower status yeah. in society. And, and that's, that's it. Mm. exactly how, mm. what I think has happened and what has mm. been perpetuated, mm. unfortunately. Mm. And that means that, for example, if you are, if the government tries to bring in qualifications which they say are designed to have the same um, status, the same kudos as A-levels, for example, they mm. just won't. Mm. A-levels trump everything. Mm. So it seems to me that un until we get rid of A-levels and bring in uh, a, a more general system of education, which would include vocational academic, mm. we're going to keep having this problem. Mm. Anything that compares with A-levels will compare poorly, mm. given the given the kind of norms, the kind of attitudes that mm. are prevalent. So there's a, there's a problem perhaps you're suggesting at the moment with who decides what is an educated mm. nineteen and how we decide that. Who do you think should decide what an educated nineteen is? Well, uh, I think we all should, and I certainly don't think it should be left to people like me, I, I think we all should uh, decide. I, I, I think that teachers and people working in education are often asked some sort of problem. Sometimes it's um, it's implied and sometimes it's direct, they're asked to, to make society better, to improve society. And there's no doubt that teachers and those working in, in, in education can and do make things better for individuals and over the long term, maybe indeed for society. I think that it should be a decision for all of us to make that we should, all of us who are, who are in society have got a, an interest in, in how, to, how young people are educated. So I think it should be a matter of discussion um, everywhere mm -hmm. and uh, I think that for local authorities, for politicians at a national level, this, this is an important political decision and I think it's right that politicians do argue about it, at least that shows that it is important, you know, it's not ignored because politicians understand that it, that, that it matters, it matters to everybody whether or not they are involved in education. Mm -hmm. We all spend our time relying upon educated people mm -hmm. to to do things for us, it matters to society. Um, but it is important to to understand that education reflects society, and asking teachers and others to to change society through education is, is to ask a great deal, I think. Mm -hmm. So it, se it seems to me that the kind of decisions about what an educated 19 year old should be, they should be political decisions. Mm -hmm. My concern is that they are decisions that are taken with very short term aims. The kind of the Ofsted cycle is a very rapid cycle, for example. Mm. The political cycle is similarly rapid. Mm. And even within that, the kind of turnover of education ministers, especially within learning and skills, has been especially rapid. Mm. Which means that initiatives are rarely given time to see whether they work or not. Mm. They just immediately get moved on. Waves really, of the waves, exactly. Exactly. And, and therefore, I think that more care and time should be put into, into these things. What's interested me is that over recent years, many government advisors and others have gone to look at Finland. And because the Finnish system has been so successful, apparently, according to, again, OECD uh, figures. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting, when you look at what politicians take back, they do take back something of what the Finns do but they only really take back what fits with their own ideology. Mm. And, that's, uh, and that's from both parties. Cherry they, they cherry pick what fits with what they think. Yeah. They're what they believe to be right, yeah. I guess. And so I suppose looking at someone like Finland, which took a hard look at its own uh, system of, of education a generation ago, a much smaller country, obviously, and a country which is much uh, more egalitarian than is. But nonetheless, a country that made a decision to change their system and went about it in a very conscious, thought-out way. It would be much more difficult in this country, but much bigger. Uh, it is more unequal, uh, more vested interests perhaps. But nonetheless, I think to take a look at our education system, mm. something that should, be, um, should involve a discussion uh, across the whole country mm. about not just whether we should have different examinations, mm. but what is education for? How do we want our 19 year olds to leave education? Mm. So who should decide? Well, we all should decide through through our democratic systems. Mm. And with some, some 
aspiration that what we have decided has some sense of permanence about it, our longevity, exactly. so that we're not continually redeciding and reformulating every time we get a new government. That's right, so there has to be some level of consensus, mm -hmm. uh, which means that people will be doing things that they don't completely agree with. Mm -hmm. But if there is some consensus, then that will allow uh, teachers and learners, students, mm -hmm. to find a way of working which is successful not just at getting them through exams, but is successful at producing rounded, engaged mm -hmm. uh, young people, mm -hmm. young adults. Well, that leads on nicely to my final question, which is about what you think an educated 19-year-old actually is today. Well, I do have views on this, and I, I think an educated 19-year-old let me talk about it in broad terms first of all. An educated 19 year old, it seems to me, should have the knowledge and wherewithal to be able to engage with the world, to, to understand society and engage with society, and also to have the knowledge and, and wherewithal to earn a living within society. And I, I think that's, that's tremendously important, or at least to progress to, uh, to obtain the knowledge and wherewithal to, to, to earn a living. Mm -hmm. I think that our young people should know about sifting through knowledge, that not all knowledge is the same value, that the kind of, the kind of Google, Googleization of the world I think is great, mm -hmm. but it's also problematic, mm -hmm. that if people think you just Google and that's the truth, mm -hmm. then that is, that is a problem. So I think young people should be able to make a judgment, of, uh, make a judgment about the provenance of, of information. And I think that young people should have a resilience about them, so a confidence in who they are, mm -hmm. um, if you like, uh, a confidence in, in being happy in their own skin, which I think is, is about being um, resilient, mm -hmm. but about knowing enough, um, at least at that, at that stage, knowing enough to act in and on the world within which they live. Mm -hmm. And I suppose in terms of curriculum, to be more concrete about it, I think that means that uh, young people should maintain some level of general education right up until 18. So it might be a small amount for those who are not, who are choosing perhaps a, a more applied or vocational route, but nonetheless to maintain some level of general education mm -hmm. right up until age 18 or 19 I think is important. Mm -hmm. But similarly, I think that those who are, if you like, considered to be the brightest, that they should be given every opportunity to follow more applied routes. They shouldn't necessarily be channeled into, into universities if that's not what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Let them do proper apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. Let them do decent high-level vocational courses. I think that, so so a, a broader education for all, but one which maintains options for young people right up until 18. Well, thank you very much for that, Kevin. It seems to me that what you're describing there is perhaps a much broader conception of what might constitute a 19-year-old than, than the one that we've become accustomed to, which is very much focused on that second point that you made around being able to earn a living. So the skills agenda has almost eclipsed all of those other potential aims, at least to some extent. And I wonder if you'd just like to finish on how hopeful you are that your vision of that broader educated 19-year-old might actually come to fruition and particularly in light of the resident participation age at the moment, are you, are you hopeful that, that, will, that it will come to pass? Well, yes, I mean, I, I remain hopeful. We have to. We have to uh, remain, uh, remain hopeful so that we can continue to make these arguments, even if you know, it's important to speak truth to power, even if, we're not always, even if we're not always listened to. And I think that clearly aspects of the education system are not working. And if your view of education is purely economistic, if it's just about human capital, that is not working, even in, even in the terms of those who argue that education should have primarily um, economistic outcomes, in other words, young people who can be upskilled. It's not working even in their terms. Mm -hmm. The OECD is saying that clearly. Their think tank, the think tank of the industrialists is saying it's not working. Now given that, I think that we have an opportunity to say education can be about more than that. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the Tomlinson report, which would have got away had, had the government followed it, 
would have got rid of, of, of A-levels. That was nearly adopted by the last government. It wasn't, and that was a tremendous shame. So it seems to me that the kind of things I'm talking about, they're not completely outlandish. They are not on the agenda at the moment. Mm. But I remain hopeful that at some point um, they will have more traction with politicians than they have at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you.